Wir beginnen, wir hätten auch mit Tom Elliott beginnen können, aber da er nicht da ist und lediglich eine, äh, einen Film sozusagen schicken konnte, beginnen wir mit einer lebenden Person, die natürlich von ihrer Bedeutung her ebenfalls äh, beginnenswürdig ist, nämlich meinem Freund Elton Barker von der Open University in Southampton. Er ist eigentlich Althistoriker und hat allerdings bereits an drei ähm, maßgeblichen äh, Projekten mitgewirkt. Zusammen mit seinem alter Ego Leif Isaksen hat er zunächst in einem kleinen Projekt, das auf den Namen Hestia hört, uns damit überrascht, wie man den Text von Herodot in einem GIS abbilden kann, wenn man sich nach den Ortserwähnungen richtet und damit eine vollkommen neue Sicht auf einen antiken Autor äh, ermöglicht, der wie viele kanonisierte Forschungs- und Lehrinhalte teilweise auch darunter leidet, dass jede Generation 90 Prozent von dem nachbetet, was die Vorgeneration gesagt hat und mühsam versucht, sozusagen neue Blickwinkel zu finden. Mit Hestia hat man das bei der Art und Weise, wie Herodot mit Ortsnamenerwähnungen umgeht, sehr viel leichter. Hier muss man sich jetzt eher im Nachhinein fragen, was die Ergebnisse von Hestia eigentlich für die Herodot-Lektüre heißen. Dann kam das Google Ancient Places Projekt, das darauf abzielte, ähnlich wie bei Herodot, nun antike Orte in der Datensammlung von Google Books zu finden und das, was man da findet, zu visualisieren. Das haben sie mit einem Geoparser gemacht, der inzwischen ist die Geoparser-Technologie ja eine der wesentlichen sozusagen Eindringformen in ähm, den Umgang mit Orten in Texten. Als letztes und sicherlich von der Breite her erfolgreichstes Projekt ist allerdings Pelagios äh, zu nennen, das Linked Ancient Geodata in offenen Systemen zusammenbringt und damit die Wissensressourcen von Datenbanken, Datensammlungen, die offen im Internet stehen, zu antiken Ortsnamen in einer Weise verbindet, wie das bisher überhaupt noch nicht der Fall gewesen ist und dieses auch tut, mit einer erstaunlich sozusagen unkomplexen Form der Annotation und dabei ständig offene Standards verwendet. Insofern freue ich mich, dass uns Elton Barker nun ähm, unter dem Titel Enabling Discovery Online hier gewissermaßen den Aufgalopp in dieses Treffen äh, liefert. Lieber Elton, it's your time. Thank you, Reinhardt. Thank you, everybody. I think you could have done my presentation there, Reinhardt. Um, two apologies. Uh, as you'll notice, I'm speaking in English. Uh, mein Deutsch ist nicht so gut, so apologies for that. And secondly, I'm not a terribly technical person. I'm a classicist, so I deal with ancient texts. So this online environment is pretty new to me. Uh, the two people who you know, I owe a great debt to for making Pelagios what it is, Leif Isaacson from the University of Southampton, and Rainer Simon of the Austrian Institute of Technology. These two guys know their uh, sparkle endpoints from their IDF, and really I don't, so um, I'll try and do my best from a, a user's perspective. Um, I like to think I'm the, the, the spanner in the works a lot of the time, so if I don't understand something from a user's perspective, I'd like to think that's a good thing. Uh, what I can do is metaphor, so we have a, a metaphor on this opening slide of a treasure of a treasure chest. Most people, when they think of a treasure chest, is to open the treasure chest and to find the good stuff inside it. Um, so they, they think of that at the end point. But the real difficulty, of course, with a treasure chest, as any good pirate knows, is discovering it in the first place. And that's what Pelagios is all about. It's all about discovering uh, the rich treasures online that are related to ancient world places. So that's what this talk is about. And this is one of those slides that um, I'm really not qualified to talk about in any detail at all. But as far as Leaf tells me, at least, there are two ways of thinking about digital semantics. That is the semantic web, uh, which, as far as I understand it, is um, about um, having a lot of metadata and having big structures behind what you're presenting and agreeing on, uh, on a great deal of the, the 
the structures behind it. And then there's linked open data, which is a lot more decentralized, as you can see from the, the image. And it's about linking stuff together. And Plagios is very much about linking stuff together. And that is, from my perspective, it's linking stuff about the ancient world. So at the minute, there's a, a whole load of stuff out there online that's really interesting to access. Uh, from text, which is what I deal with generally, but also archaeological sites, archaeological data, um, inscriptions, museum objects, but they tend to be housed in their own what we might call data silos. So Pelagios is a way of trying to draw together this very rich content that's out there um, so that you can then go from one resource to another resource and you break down this uh, data silo mentality. So what Plagios is not about, I think that's, this is a useful uh, thing to, first of all, flag up. It's not one ring to rule them all, okay? It's not about aggregating your data in one place. It's not about having very complex federated searches. It's not about having a standard way of representing your data, and it's not about aligning your schema. All those things are, are more related to that, uh, the, the semantic web technologies that I was talking about before. What we're about is connecting through common references rather than a common schema. So it's about having a, a particular thing that you can connect to. And the common reference point that we use is Pleiades, which is why it's a bit odd that perhaps I'm talking first. We should hear Tom talk about Pleiades, but here's, if you like, a brief uh, flagging up of what Pleiades do. Pleiades give us something really important. And if there's one take-home point from this talk, it's this, that Pleiades use URIs, Uniform Resource Identifiers, for referring to ancient places. So they're a gazetteer of um, um, ancient world places. Um, by giving us a unique code, we are then able to disambiguate between different places. For example, there are 17 Alexandrias in the ancient world. How do I know that the Alexandria in my text is the same as the Alexandria in your text? By having URI, we're able to do that. So here we have a text just drawn from Google Books. And what we do here is not try to have a kind of uniform structure behind things, but um, use a Pleiades URI to say that this particular place being mentioned, whether that's Athens or Sparta, the two examples highlighted, have a particular code. And by giving it that particular code, it allows this linking to develop. So you, from the top, you have Pleiades' places. At the bottom, you have the ancient world resources. And what Pelagios does is to connect the two together. So you can go from both the document to the text, uh, from the document to the place, and also back again from the place to the document. So Pelagios is a, is a way of drawing together these uh, the online documents through the common reference of an ancient place. And so far, um, I, I guess the other thing I should really emphasize here that like I said before, it's not a centralized model. It's very decentralized. It's perhaps better to think of it more in terms of a network. And so far, we've been growing this network so that we have lots of uh, people um, in this room already connected to us. Uh, RACNI, of course, a German arch archaeological database. Um, we also have Totten Book from uh, the University of Cologne. Lots of ancient world places with v dealing with v lots of ancient world uh, projects dealing with very different kinds of documents, whether that's textual, visual, whatever, and not just also universities, but also museums and independents. One of our latest uh, contributors um, is a project called Squinch Picks. It's a guy who's got a digital camera and he goes about uh, certain ancient places like Rome and Athens, taking lots of very high quality digital photographs of what he sees. And you know, that's just what he does in his spare time. But by attaching a URI, a Pleiades URI to the, the documents that he posts online, he's then joined our network. So what you can do when, you have, uh, when you've joined the Plagios network. I think there are three really important things. First of all, there's context. So you, as, a, um, as someone who produces the data yourself, you can obtain links to online data that may be relevant to your own. You can enrich your data by being part of this network. Secondly, and I think just as importantly, you enable your own data to be discovered. 
so other people can find out what, you, what you've got by following links on other partners' websites. And thirdly, uh, you have reuse. So people can not only access your material, but then reuse it. Um, because we provide what we call um, the Pelagios API. So that once you've got the API, then other groups can then use that. So what we have here is just a very brief description of what our API looks like for the island of Delos. We have um, underneath the, the, the useful map to let you know where Delos is, if you weren't quite sure. You've got the list of partners who's, um, who've got some kind of document that refers to the island of Delos. And underneath that, we've tried to uh, give, give the user, again, think from a user's perspective, give the user some more information. So here we have, if you like, the neighborhood places that are most associated with Delos in the documents of our partners. So the, most, so the places most often related to Delos in these documents are Athens, Rome, Hellas, which is Greece, and the Peloponnesus. So already there, hopefully some interesting patterns can emerge that other people like myself, you know, a, a scholar who works in this, uh, in this field, can start following up some interesting connections. As part of our development of um, the API and of growing this network, we've also been experimenting with uh, the interfaces and um, how we can start using the API on other, on other partners' websites. So we've been developing our own widgets that people can use. So you can just have a, a widget that sits on your website so that when someone is looking at your data, they can then uh, by just clicking on the, the P for Plagios, they can find out what other partners in the network might have related to this particular document that you're looking at, related to place. So here we have, again, the, the, the Google Maps interface with the, the places mentioned and the list of partners um, who have got documents related to these places. That's kind of okay and good. You know, we've been developing this ourselves using user testing, but I think perhaps most exciting is what other people have been doing. So I want to give you a couple of examples of um, partners who have been using our own, um, have been using our API, but from their own perspective. You know what they want to do. So the first one of these is Open Context. This is run by Eric Kanzer from the University of Berkeley. It's um, a free open access resource for the electronic publication of primary field research from archaeology. Um, and so if you have archaeological data, you can post this on Eric's website, Open Context. It's free to use, free to reuse. And what we have on the left-hand side is Eric making use of our API. So here we have some coins um, in a particular location in Turkey. And on the left-hand side, there are partners' documents that, uh, that have some kind of information related, again, to this particular location. Perhaps even more exciting is what the people at the Ancient World um, Institute in New York have been doing. They've been developing a, a um, they've been using a JavaScript library for um, using our API. So that what you can do is when you're scrolling, I quite like this because it reminds me of my online shopping experience. Okay, you you can pass your browser over a text and a pop-up bubble bubble comes up telling you what's at the end of that link. So you don't even have to click on the link now. You get a sense of what's there, and and you can make a judgment then whether it's worth pursuing. And this is like I said, this is nothing to do with us. We we've, we've produced the API. And these guys at the, the Ancient World Institute in New York have then developed this, I think, really great functionality for making best use of that API. One of the last things I want to talk about is, okay, can we come up with interesting interfaces to make use of the, the documents that we have? So one of our early visualizations is what's called the Graph Explorer. And it's, again, one of those slides that, you know, whenever I come to present this, I wish that Leaf were here or Rainer to really explain what's going on here. But you know, I'll do my best. On the left-hand side, the, um, we're exploring uh, the relationships between places through the data that we have about them. And on the right-hand side, it's the reverse. We're exploring the relationships between the data through plates. Again, the central idea, one of the key principles of Pelagios is being able to go from the document to the place and find out about the places mentioned in the documents, or alternatively, go from the places to the documents, find out about the documents that refer to a particular kind of place. 
this was an early visualization and we user tested it, but um, uh, we didn't really have to do that because I, I was also um, scratching my head about this. This is something that I found quite difficult to use, different, difficult kind of functionality with this kind of visualization. And it's only going to get more complicated as we get more and more people joining the network. One thing that uh, we've been developing since though is what's called heat mapping. And this is kind of cool because um, what you have here, um, the, the stronger the, the heat, if you like, the more documents we have related to that particular place. So here we're looking at the Peloponnese and Attica, and well, no surprise here, the strongest heat uh, bubble that you see here is located around Athens. But this instantly gives you a sense of the kinds of documents, online documents now part of the Pelagios network, where they're to be found and perhaps where they're not found. And that would then highlight um, perhaps work that still needs to be done in the field, not only about online research, but more generally in classics. So the, I quite like this because it gives you, it uses, I think, the very um, uh, impactful idea of a visualization of the map and it allows you a way into finding out more about the, the documents yeah, that are online referring to these particular places. Perhaps even more exciting is again what some of our partners have been doing. So this is a map that's been created by Johan Aufelt from Regnum Fancorum Online. Um, we actually uh, got him on board on Pelagios right at the end of phase two of Pelagios and he magnificently constructed ancient world mapping tiles for us which is uh, I think a, again a really useful outcome not just for technical people but from, from, from users like myself so that now there's instead of having to rely upon Google Earth or Google Maps or um, other such mapping tiles we now have um, digital mapping tiles for the ancient world. So what would be good is to have different kinds of maps of the ancient world. At the minute it's set in the first century AD, but at least it's a rough ballpark um, kind of location for um, the ancient world. Much better than, say, Google Maps. But Johan has also been experimenting with, again, using our data and um, bringing in, mashing up other kinds of data. So what we have here are some locations in uh, England, Great Britain, um, the digital mapping tile that Johan has created, so you know, using accurate uh, coordinates of um, ancient places, again using uh, the URIs from Pleiades, but on the right hand side he's lifted a map from, uh, you yeah, know, historical map, uh, that gives you, as a user, more information about what's, what's there on, um, on the landscape. So we have here on the right hand side, it's just an ordnance survey map from a few decades ago, but it gives you information about the, the archaeological sites that are there. The fact that there's a, this is a Roman town, there are these, there's a particular fort there, there's this kind of archaeological data. Uh, and this is uh, on his site, it's just a question of clicking on a particular link and it brings up this map and again you, what you're doing there is enriching your data, you're clicking through to find other kinds of information. So to sum up and to finish, um, there are three steps to the Pelagios heaven, you know, how you link your data. So first of all, you know, the, the primary thing is you have to make your data available over the web with these stable URIs. Now I've been talking about the ancient world and about ancient world places, but of course this, this can be extended to any other kinds of um, uh, document, not necessarily relating to places, but also people. For example, you could have URIs for people or events. Um, and of course, not just related to the ancient world, but taking that right, right through to the modern day world. So this, this idea, although I've been talking about the ancient world, is extensible to any other kind of subject in any other kind of period. So first of all, you make your data available over the web with these stable URIs. Then you map your place references to the Pleiades Gazetteer. So that's the difficult part. That uh, requires you to use the, the URIs that Pleiades provides so that you can then have this linking operation uh, going on. And then thirdly, you publish your place references as RDF. Now, the important thing here is, is this is separate from your data. 
Um, again, I want to emphasize that we hold no partner's data. The, 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 the partners are responsible for their own data. This is a decentralized model. So um, at any one point, if a partner drops out, or indeed if Pelagios for some reason were to, to drop out, the structure would still exist because each person is holding their own, each project is holding their own data. Um, and we've been using an open annotation vocabulary to provide some kind of basic structure. So there's a basic structure between, uh, behind the annotation model that we're using, really the, the, the most basic that, that we can think of, to try to make this as easy as possible. That's what it's about. It's trying to make um, your job as data providers as easy as possible to be able to link to other, other data providers. Now, there are various challenges that have been identified so far. I'm not going to go through them all. I think a, a couple worth highlighting. First of all, we've discovered, or perhaps better, our partners have discovered, that sometimes their data is a bit of a mess and it needs cleaning up. So one, uh, one thing that joining a network does, such as Plagios, is to get you th to think much harder about how you're representing your own data and what kind of data you have there. Um, there's also the kind of conceptualizing the data, how you express the relationship between data and place. And one thing I think we're already noticing now is that now that the network has grown and we're getting more and more data and Arachne have kindly uh, provided such a large data set that it, it almost swamps everything else as part of the network, is that we need greater ways to differentiate with, in the data. Just to give a simple example, um, Say I'm working on the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, writing about 5th century BC. Um, I'm, I'm a literary expert, but I want to get a sense of the archaeological data that's out there related to Herodotus. I want to be able to um, be able to uh, differentiate between the documents related to Athens. I don't want necessarily uh, information given back to me about Athens of the 1st century B AD. I want information related to Athens of the first century BC. At the minute, because uh, the network is still only just growing, it's okay to have uh, no kind of differentiation and just to get all the returns back related to Athens of, the, you know, of any period. But as we get more and more people uh, joining, then it's going to be important for us to be able to start differentiating between particular times to make, again, the data more valuable and, again, make it easier for users like myself, to be able to make best use of that data. But primarily, it's about keeping it simple. So here we are. Linked data can be simple and it can be useful. That's, if you like, the, the major outcome of what we've discovered so far. You should also use a common vocabulary rather than using a common grammar, or at least you should start off with a common vocabulary before building to a common grammar. You know, again, making it simple for both the data provider and those people who want to chase up the links. The web is a two-way street. It's a dialogue. It's about trying to enable people to uh, access the data, you know, discover it, and then make best use of it. Um, it's not a broadcast medium. It's not about just being given back something. You need to be able to initiate a dialogue between the user and the data that you've got. And perhaps most importantly, we shouldn't try to build this linked open data ourselves or all at once. Okay, and what we've tried to do all the time through Pelagios is to build a network where people are continually innovating and developing what we're doing and building on what we're doing. So the infrastructure is going uh, uh, out from the center rather than concentrating towards the center. It's a, it's a bottom-up approach rather than the top-down imposition. It's about finding your own role within this wider ecology. So that's where we are, but I just want to leave you with a, a brief tantalizing hint of what the future might look like, and that is extending Pelagios through to the idea of early geospatial documents. That is to say, um, any kind of material relating to places up to the discovery of the Americas, where that kind of, that's a, a paradigm shift there. So this is a potential Pelagios 3, which is uh, one of the things we want to be doing is to enable people to annotate maps. 
So um, trying to f uh, find uh, automated, semi-automated ways to enable people to make use of toponyms on, on um, ancient maps and ancient representations of maps uh, to again enrich this um, uh, this data that we're collecting about ancient places. If you want to know more, uh, we have a, a very active blog, and again, Arachne are one of the, the best bloggers on our site, and they, if you want to know anything about their RDF structures, I do urge you to go there. Um, our API is, uh, is available at this particular website, and we also have been trying to distill some of the lessons that we've been learning, uh, both from a technical and also from a user perspective, on um, what we call a cookbook, and that's um, openly available on GitHub. So these, uh, that's all I have to say, and these, if you want to know more and you want to hear what the experts say about it, I urge you to go there. Many thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alton. I think we got some time to discuss. Should we do that in English? Uh, if you wouldn't mind, please. All right. I mean, probably for the people to think about what they want to ask, I would say one sentence only uh, to kill some time. <laughs> um, I guess what you showed is has for me two uh, or three main properties first. It shows how the web can enable the discourse in science. That means it is uh, not only a question of how big you are as an institution, it has not necessarily anything to do with how much impact you can reach. The second thing is, okay, you showed us your linked data principle against the semantic web. Um, uh, we would know probably, we would like to know how the Saturday morning answer on the question would be how you will ever make sense of linked data after you connected it. Mm. Um, I, don't, I don't mean that polemically, but uh, we have to, you, you explained it briefly, how different this paradigm is in respect to the semantic web that doesn't work either very well, you know, so uh, we don't have to, point fingers there. And the third thing is pretty clear, and a lot of EU projects are living on that, that uh, you might have a, an authority on the web that would enable you to sort your data, which is the Pleiades Gazetteer in this place. And you might have a lot of knowledge, more or less fuzzy knowledge around the web. And uh, this fuzzy knowledge is in systems that probably don't refer themselves to the authority. So you need some intermediate mm -hmm. thing, which is Pelagios in your, in your place, and made, yeah, Pelagios made an impact that uh, is 100 times higher than 10 million euro EU projects promising the same, namely, to interlink between the knowledge resources on the web and some already existing authorities. So you probably should, should sell your stuff if you <laughs> to the give EU us Commission. Tens of millions, that's perfectly great as well. Yeah. All right, now it's your time. Who has questions? Now, oh, come on, we're on a discussion here. <laughs> You're among friends. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody wants to say anything? Yep. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm actually from the ministry itself, and out of curiosity, what kinds of documents are you looking at? What kind well, of documents are you using? Ancient text sources, uh, uh, scholarly literature, w what is it? Um, really anything. Uh, it's, um, I work with ancient texts myself, but we have um, also archaeological data, we have digital photographs. Um, what the people at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World are doing, I've mentioned them before regarding their very nice JavaScript pop-up, but they've also just released an online journal whereby um, they're interested in um, incorporating secondary literature, so scholarship also. So you can then link through, you're reading an article online, and you can just follow up the, the hyperlinks and find out 
you know, again, what, when you cite a particular author, uh, giving the user access to what that author has to say right there and then online. So it's a way of, an, um, from my perspective, it's um, as a scholar, we're chasing up links all the time in libraries, in, in written sources. This is a way of trying to do the, enabling the same kind of activity in an online environment. So in answer to your question, that document can be anything. It can be a text, it can be an image, it can be the archaeological data, it can be some philosophical treaties, and it can also be scholarship itself. Uh, and in fact, uh, I mean, it's a very good point because, again, as a, as a classicist, we've tended, to, well, I know I, I've been guilty of this, tended to just focus on my particular discipline within classics, which is literature. But classics is much bigger than just, you know, the books. You know, there's also the archaeology, the philosophy, um, the history. And, and from my perspective, the online environment can reintroduce this crucial interdisciplinarity to the subject and provide that essential context so that when I'm reading my text, I've got a much richer sense of the, the cultural context in which these texts are initially embedded and then received over generations. So for me, it's about really reinvigorating the whole discipline and making it truly interdisciplinary again. We've, we've tended to go down into our own yeah, singular disciplinary uh, authorities. Other right. questions? Yeah, uh, Elton, you said a great thing about, uh, about the project is that it's decentralized, yeah. uh, but still when the project is gone, when it appears, disappears, there will be a lot of people who rely on it that have a problem. Still, the data is, is at the partners, but have you been thinking about the continuity of the, the Well, project? of course, we think about continuity all the time. And um, our, so thus far, we've been funded by a, a body in uh, the UK called JISC. And, our f and that's, been, that's happened through two successive programs now. But our first JISC manager gave us this very useful, I think, uh, uh, thing to think about, which is uh, uh, sustainability is reuse. So if you get people to use your stuff, then it will become sustained. Um, and I think actually one thing that we've been doing by developing this, 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 this uh, very um, um, basic structure, were Pelagios suddenly to have no funding uh, tomorrow, touch wood, that's not going to happen, the structure would still be there in place. And everything is archived, and there's all the information there on GitHub, which is you know, openly available. So some other group can come along and take over. And this is the same kind of model that Pleiades themselves work with. So I know that Tom is very, con Tom Elliott of Pleiades, who you'll hear from virtually very shortly, also talks about the same kind of thing, that were Pleiades to go down, the URIs are there. So it's just a question of some other project coming along and, and picking it up. So it's not a case that it's just going to suddenly disappear. That's one of the key principles, I think, of this decentralized model, to be honest. There's a question here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are also uh, uh, rich scientific predators on the web. I don't mean uh, the German Archaeological Institute, but uh, others that are just looking for interesting things that get funded for a short time and then they can pick it up and, and publish it under their own uh, agenda, which is probably not the best thing. But the sustainability of Pelagios is also naturally its partners in that sense that if those guys become all EU project man managing bosses, uh, then probably one of the partners who has a bigger stake in Pelagios would let that software run. Uh, in its own environment. So, uh, but basically, naturally, that's always the problem with everything that is uh, online. Okay, over there. Um, are there uh, educational target groups which are already involved? Are there a group of history teachers trying to, you know, taking a good entrance for, for, for students to learn to take this material? as material for their classes in school? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think I want to answer that in two ways. First of all, we must remember that uh, Pelagios is a network, and each of our partners has their own target audience, and many of those partners are precisely interested in um, developing this knowledge and, and um, exploring 
you know, these documents in a school environment or in a higher educational environment or in a library environment. So that's already going on with, as regards our partners and a good example there might be Perseus for example which is um, this classical online library of texts that is essential for any kind of undergraduate student to be able to access. But another of the projects that I've been working on individually is called Hestia. I think Reinhardt introduced it at the beginning. Um, we've just heard that we've got some um, more funding precisely to be able to bring Hestia into the network. And one of the things we'll be doing there is precisely uh, introducing Hestia into a school environment and trying to get students to start playing around with some of the data. Um, but secondly, as, as we, with a Plagios hat on and, and not just thinking about individual partners but thinking about, the, if you like, the whole thing of what Pelagios can do and its um, ability to be able to link across different kinds of data sets, we conducted some user testing in the, the end of the first round of the Pelagios project. Uh, that's where you know, I showed those, uh, that image of the graph explorer before that I said um, users had found difficult, yeah, I had found it difficult, but that was confirmed by having uh, university undergraduates, PhD students, um, also just some people just interested in the classical world, not, not scholarly. We got them to use it and they had all kinds of problems with it. So that was really useful for us in terms of getting us to think about if you're, I mean the, the, the critical thing is you're maybe reading an online document let's say on Google Books, you find a particular place that you're interested in, you notice there's a hyperlink, you know, this thing called you know, Pelagios, you click through and you then land on the Pelagios page that, bring, that tries to bring together in some way all these different kinds of documents. What's that like as a user if you have no idea what all these other documents are doing? So that's something that we're, we're particularly concerned about, but at the same time we want peop uh, each of the partners to develop their own methods to do this too. And I think I've got the, the red card, so okay. that's it. Yeah, we used up all our uh, time we had spared in advance. But um, it's important to get into the discussion, I guess. And we will cut down on the question what kind of potential there might be between Wikimedia, Wikidata, and Pelagios, which is probably a question worth discussing. Um, but we will not do this in this place here.